Greetings and salutations, all you beautiful individuals. We are back. It's Lee Guy Mark Eric and Mark here with you beauties for a rare little weekend recap. We got no LCS, no LEC. Thankfully, we had a whole lot of on and off rift action and news to talk about in both the LCK and the LPL. I'm calling this one the recharge weekend for all of you hooligans out there like us that are keeping track with multiple regions across the globe and everything else. LCS on break, LEC in between splits, not a lot of crazy things, just a, enough, a little dash of it in the LPL and LCK to talk about uh, for your weekend recap. Thank God we did get the absolute marquee matchup in the LPL and... It delivered on that hype. Of course, we're talking JDG versus BLG over two hours on the Rift. Two out of the three of these matches were 40 minutes plus, And pretty much every single one of these games, one team fight goes a different way. It could have been the opposite squad coming away with the win. This was maybe the closest series we've had all year. For months, you've had this one circled on the calendar, instantly knowing that this was going to be one of the top matches you had to see in the LPL for this spring split. JDG, BLG, and these heavyweights gave you the, the match that you wanted to see. As you described, one team fight goes the way of the other in any of these ones. All the way through three games in the series, you can see the other squad coming out on top. But unfortunately for your JDG fans, we're talking about the BLG come through. And, I mean, Game 3 might have been the most back and forth. You have a 5-0 Darius to start the game, and somehow JDG just masterfully kites him around. Bin was never able to really do anything in these fights. You had a few fantastic uh, Lee Sin insect plays out of Kanavi. Ruler ends up getting 15 kills on the Kaisa, and then it takes... One team fight where Kanavi walks into a Nautilus hook, BLG turns the entire game around and somehow wins the game. Anybody with any type of ADC experience has had to go up against a team that has got a Darius that is way out in front and you know what type of threat that represents. So to look at Ruler and the gameplay that goes on, the decisions, the actual execution there from him to get to that kill point on that Kai'Sa is something so special and to see it all go for waste and not get the victory is a painful one to look at on the side of JDG. This was the top series that you wanted to see in the LPL delivering all the way through to give us the big fireworks from the elite teams. And the rivalry only continues now because this, you know, remember going back to last year, it was time and time again, BLG can't beat JDG. BLG can beat everyone in the world, but not JDG. And now we've got the Night Yagao swip, swap and... BLG does it. So is Knight the secret sauce? Is he the answer to it? I mean, Yigao held up his own more than enough in this series. So I'd like to say I'd love to be able to just focus in, boil down this series into that matchup, into the transaction, you know, swap into the players and everything else. I think there is just so much that happened on the side of JDG, and especially when you look at what 369 contributed last year for this team, and to look at Flandre, which who has been much better than expectations and has been very good it's just living up to what 369 was able to offer and how well he fit and complemented the rest of where this team was popping off that's where i see that little bit of less power on jdg compared to last year but the fight that they showed against a top running blg so far they've shown me that they can be at that type of level yeah especially that Flandre 369 Swip was noticed in that third game. I know Udyr versus Darius, you're not going to be able to do much, but that was definitely a gap from what we were seeing out of 369 last year. The other huge marquee matchup, this time in the LCK, did not quite live up to the hype. We thought KT were sandbagging a bit ahead of this Telecom War matchup by dropping a Hanwha life. They'd come full steam ahead, no expectations against T1, and... Uh, Maybe there weren't super high expectations, but uh, they kind of got smacked. We were trying to figure out whether that loss to Hanwell Life was simply the small dip in the roller coaster before you get right back up again, right? You got to go and pick up a little bit of speed. We're still picking up speed as KT Rollster continues. They didn't rebuild the track in time. Oh, jeez. They're, they're rocketing down, and it is T1 taking advantage of it in this edition of the Telecom Wars. Almost always a guaranteed banger in some sort of sense. Either we're going the full distance, you got that back and forth, or there's a spicy pick here or there. 
pretty mild edition of the Telecom Wars this time around. T1 dominated. Of course, if you look at the scoreline between game one and game two, probably the only spice or real seasoning in this matchup is the Smolder pick coming through for Gumiishi for the first time. Yeah, he ended up getting a triple kill, not even a penta. Come on, step it up, Guma. But uh, he was deathless across both of these games. 29-7 to seven, uh, kill favor for T1 across the series and 19-4 to four in turrets. So even though both of these games went north of 30 minutes, this was T1 in control from start to finish. And honestly, compared to most of their other games this split, there wasn't much spice or pizzazz that they needed to even add to pick ban in this set. It was very business as usual, taking care of it, just, you know, check mark, check mark, check mark from the T1 players and the way they were going through. For KT, it kind of feels like you're looking at this one again as we talked about that slide for them and where you find yourself digging out of it. I feel like you got to kind of almost memory wipe this one out of it and focus still on that Hanwha series and where you were wrong there in this situation because so much went wrong for KT in this one against T1 outplayed in many aspects. You're looking at the top lane, I'm looking at someone like Perfect T is again, checking in with him and his progression as a rookie. Tough matchup against Mr. Zeus in the top side, certainly one that Zeus flexed on him and showed him that type of power that is necessary to be the top, top laner in the LCK. And listen, the gap now between T1 and pretty much every opponent T1 is first in gold differential at 15, barren percentage, first turret rate, and kills per game. It's starting to feel like they're about as far ahead of the competition as during that undefeated run uh, in the spring split a couple of years ago. Obviously, still need that Gen G T1 matchup, uh, the rematch, but it really feels like T1 is unmatched right now. It really looks, given the form that T1 has shown, the way that they have executed against multiple opponents here, the compositions that we have seen, the variety of them, the control, the mastery of these, uh, you know, uh, tweaks and introductions, introductions to the, the meta that they want to bring in and how they're executing on it. This is a T1 lineup that is full steam ahead in the LCK. Only thing that I'm scared about is the curse, the Gen G lingering around, and whether it's a mental. That only block comes at this in point. in playoffs too. And that's the thing. And it's all going to be about the mental for me because you've certainly proven as world champions, as LCK Titans, that you are at that level that you can dispatch of an opponent like Gen G and you should be favored in it. But history has told us that Gen G has found a way to equal it out in the series, bring you down and get that opportunity. And that opportunity has been all that they've needed. JDG, BLG, probably the best series of the weekend. The worst play of the weekend and it's coming into the Monday so it's a carryover into the Monday but it's coming from one of the premier teams in the LPL top esports looked like they were well on their way to a calm cool controlled game three victory then their brains got turned off they decide we want to chase a Fiora around for a long time and then we'll start up a Baron there's nothing going on in the mid lane right FPX isn't running it down to close out the game they start this baron when fpx is already on their inhib turret huh i i don't know how this happens and it is really frustrating but every year we get a new example of a team just completely ignoring the most obvious thing to take care of which is that mid lane wave making sure that you've got that wave in a manageable position and oh no it's too late. The time is running down. You've got the opportunity on the other side. And it's one of these ones where only 369 has recognized. Got to get somebody back. Unless maybe I, I'll, I'll, I'll take the error on this one if the comms show otherwise. But it looks like 369 is the only one that recognizes it. He's got to get back there. And nobody, nobody from Top Esports is keeping life off of him. He stops him. Hey, come on, guys. you got to get this control. We had the Pentakill Rel. For Tian in game one in this series, and you're still coming out of this one on a loss. It it's so bizarre because it feels like this is the thing that we've been highlighting. The change with Mako coming over is the macro, the communication, the map movement has been so much better out of top esports in 2024 compared to the last couple of years. So I'm hoping this is just a one-off. Whoopsie, maybe Mako dropped his headset or his microphone got muted all of a sudden. Normally, normally I'd be right there with you. I'd be hoping, I'd be believing it. But the problem is it's top esports. We've seen these type of moments from this organization before. You can go back 
Gigabyte Marines Levi on, on the Karthus. You remember that situation? Ugh. Oh, no. Top Esports is cursed. Top Esports is cursed when it comes to just... I, I can't believe they looked at the minimap and decided that this was the play to make because they should have been closing out this uh, third game relatively easily, especially when they're riding so high. As you mentioned earlier in the series, your first ever Rel Pentakill out of Tien. He looked so damn happy. It was hilarious seeing them try to give him that final kill on Cassante <laughs> when the Rel does absolutely zero damage. It's got to be the lowest damage percentage Pentakill of all time as the most wet noodle of a pentakill that we have ever seen come through in League of Legends. But congratulations, Rel. Congratulations, Tien. You're going to have to take that as your silver lining, a, a very dark cloud, given the way that the decision-making ends on this one. I would have loved if they actually didn't look at the minimap. That is the better explanation for it for me, that it just simply completely went under the radar, and they, that's how it happened. Because if there's any type of situational awareness of, oh, yeah, don't worry about it, that's where I'm going. What do you mean, don't worry about it? And not looking at the minimap happens to the best of us, except most people that happens to don't ever climb out of gold in solo queue. And uh, these guys are professionally on the scene, but still feeling good about top esports. One terrible play doesn't take away from them looking like one of the better teams in the LPL. FPX now sitting at five and three. I mean, credits where credit due. Go to their comms and they could probably say ah, they're trolling. They're on bear and just end the game. Milky Way is now quickly ascending to stardom as this rookie jungler. It's not just about the name, my man. If he's making his way through, he's making the plays for the squad. And this is absolutely something we talked about just a little bit ago. FPX, can they climb into this label, the dark horse territory of the LPL, where you got to make sure you're checking your, your homework when you're looking at them in a playoff scenario, because you better believe wins like this, series like this, this is an FPX team that is destined to grab one of those final spots for the playoffs. Quick check-in with Gen G over the weekend. Chovy is trying to climb his way up the Mount Rushmore of Azir players. Had a nice little five-man Azir shuffle to close out the series against Fox. It looked like he finally got bored of that game. And I'm going to be careful here because I got a, a mighty bias for my Emperor of Sharima, the Shifting Sands. But we've seen quite a, a healthy dose of him for a couple of, uh, of weeks and patches here. A couple of now years, what I'll yeah. say. Yeah, we've been very, I'll say, accustomed to seeing him in the mid lane in these ones. And we've seen various flows of the builds. And, and of course, now more recently, this tank Azir, not necessarily the, the biggest fan of that one, even though we have seen the results show that it is effective. Chovy, don't need no tank Azir. He's making the plays no matter what for Genji. And, uh, you know, again, 2-0. Fox had moments where they were in it, but Genji pretty much business as usual. It was absolutely anything but business as usual across the LCK, especially on that Sunday matchup. First, you had D plus and DRX uh, clocking in just under seven hours to play a best of three. There's a 10 minute pause, a 20 minute pause, a 40 minute pause. And in the end, you have KDF and bro sitting there waiting as the second of the double header. They're there these full six hours. And then the LCK finally goes, oh yeah, you guys aren't playing today, but thanks for showing up. That is the most crazy thing to have happened this weekend out of everything we've listed off, of course, is the DDoS attacks going on in the LCK for this match. Ping issues all across it. As you mentioned, seven hours, six to seven hours for this series to reach its conclusion. Obviously something to be talked about for DRX and the DK players that are involved in that series. But as you mentioned, there was a whole other series after that that was waiting for that one to finish. The players are there. I don't know what the situation is, what the protocol is. If I'm a player in that one, I'm saying, let me into the, the Riot PC bong here. The, you know, Let me go play some games, grab some snacks or whatever, because this is crazy. The LCK ran through almost every single piece of pre-recorded uh, production footage that they've got possible to fill the time. Shout outs uh, to the casters keeping it cool throughout that time. There was a lot going on in the LCK throughout that break. Yeah, and I don't know the exact timing, but the second that KDF Bro series ended up being pre-recorded and the two squads were playing from home, so they wait these six hours, and I don't know if they just both drove back to their houses and then played from home for that series, but uh, absolute crazy. I've never really heard of DDoSing affecting like this since like 2013 or 2012 at the start of these games, but uh, by the way, how about Bro? Back-to-back -back series 
beating KDF going from winless to win streak. Yeah, and I think this is going to be one of those ones where you, you you lessen it maybe a little bit because it is that back-to-back -back with the opponent situation, and it's going to be about how much you're weighing it, whether this is about broke, turning the corner, finding something, and starting to put the building blocks together, or is this about Kwangdong freaks having the struggle, really you know, going through some growing pains, learning all these type of lessons in the middle of the split as we look at this you know relatively young roster that has these aspirations to be one of these playoff teams in the LCK. This was a heck of a day to go through the whole thing of it all. I don't know the exact specifics of when they played at all. I will give credit to the LCK. They have been incredibly transparent and informative to the, the viewers and the fan base of what is going on, the issues that they were going with. I'll give them kudos on that. Yeah, and the, you know, that last series kind of gets an asterisk because it was <laughs> all over the place. Like, I know going, dropping 2-0 to a bro is something we should be concerned about, Guang Gong, but I'm not as concerned as I should be because of this whole scenario. And listen, it's not just the LCK that's had some disasters in terms of the broadcast so far, the split. The LPL, the English broadcast, we know they took huge steps back. It's only a couple of times a week. It's hard to find the games, the highlights, the videos aren't Honestly, the broadcasts don't seem as high quality, even just video-wise. The, the LEC is cutting away in the middle of a game four of the finals. It ironically feels like the LCS is the only major region that hasn't had huge issues so far in spring. Not only that, I'm going to give a big W to the LCS, a rare oh. LCS North Ooh. American W coming through on the broadcast because not only have they not had issues, We've had changes come through, innovations for the LCS broadcast that has made it a better viewing experience, not only than the past, but compared to the other regions is something you got to be looking at. Yes, the LCS, we're picking up a dub here. It might not be on the Rift. It might be on the broadcast, but we're still taking this one. And they're the ones that made the most changes coming into the split, which makes it even more surprising that they haven't had uh, any of these issues. Obviously, most of them, I know the LEC, we heard it. I forget the number, but it was more than half of their entire broadcast staff they're laying off so no surprise they're having that and the ddos thing i mean i don't know how someone was able to get in and hack the whatever's going on in the lck but definitely something they're going to be looking at you know they wouldn't attempt this on a t1 day because oh the truck's coming for them if you interrupt <laughs> faker squad you do not want the wrath of the unkillable demon king and his fan club behind him for the rest of T1. Yeah, you don't want to risk it on that one. That's where I was wondering, why is this on DRX and D, and D, D plus Kia? Why is this, of course, the match that you're picking for? It? Who knows? That's where they practice, mind. you know, build up. So uh, get the winless <laughs> or one win bros before uh, other squads are getting mad at you. Look, as much as I love the LCK Pause podcast, get out of here with your DDoS attacks. We want our games out there on the Rift. couple more LPL things that happened over the weekend. It's probably most certainly time to start panicking. If you're L and V, it's a classic case. They had that tough schedule, and I feel like it kind of broke the team down a bit because now a five-game losing streak ninjas in pajamas the latest team to kick them while they're down it's two and six now 15th place in the lpl for lng right now and it's gotten so bad for lng in this situation that even the ninjas in pajamas aren't super happy about this one because this was supposed to be the win that elevated that validated what they've been doing so far in this early seat early part of the spring split in the lpl that they were a legit contender they were one of these teams to keep track of and i still think that question remains and, and is a valid one looking at these ninjas in pajamas even with this victory but you got to be looking at this lng side and there is the question marks of whether they will have enough time whether they're even capable of digging themselves out of the abyss that they've created with this poor start to the split. Scout individually, I don't think, has been at his very best, and how much of that is going with not having that right-hand man in Tarzan in the jungle alongside you, not seeing that same firepower from this LNG team. Tarzan is the guy laughing the most right now because he caught the most flame for how things fizzled out for LNG at the World Championship, maybe rightfully so, but he was such a focal point for them in all their success domestically, and it definitely feels like 
that's something you're missing if they're, you're this squad uh, going forward. We know it's not even easy to make 10th in the LPL because there's so many stacked teams in the middle of the table. So definitely going to have their work cut out for them now going forward, RLNG. Same can be said for a couple of those middle-of-the-pack squads like Weibo and OMG. Bit of a surprise, Weibo gets absolutely clapped in Game 3 by OMG. Light has maybe his worst individual performance of the split, and we're still waiting for Spring Emperor Zhao Hu to show up. I'll take the blame on this one. I, 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 right as we were talking before this week, I was, we were talking about Weibo, and I was saying, ah, people are forgetting about how crucial Light was during their time. He was contributing throughout a lot of these wins. He was a vital part of that damage that was relied upon there for the team. And of course, we get a very, very poor performance. Don't let him uh, get to Tristana. The That's a mid lane pick for Zhao Hu from now on. He's the type of, he's fueled by the negativity. He needs the haters to be on him, to get him going. I can't give him his flowers, his roses situation for light. It has been a struggle for him, but yes, that doesn't also exclude the struggles that Shahu has been having in the mid lane for this team. Certainly someone that we can look at and rely upon for his type of leadership and his type of carry potential in game. Weibo hasn't been able to rely upon that early on this year. They've definitely felt you know, a few degrees of separation removed from what we were getting. Listen, they were inconsistent with the shy, but you still had those high moments where they're going to the world finals or they look like a legitimate competitive team uh, to contend for a title in the LPL. We have not gotten close to reaching that ceiling so far here in spring. Yeah, the shy was able to create either throughout his own advantages or the pressure or attention that had to go towards what type of player and play style he would bring that it kind of created an environment which allowed players like Shahu Light to thrive, to get advantages that maybe they aren't provided with when someone like the Shy is out of the lineup. And that attention, that pressure, that focus is then shifted to other avenues, other areas where they can specialize in and negate you from getting something, I think is one of those things we're looking at with Weibo. They're going to have to find a solution. Is going to have to be the way that Weibo dig themselves out of it. And there's a lot of scary teams ahead of them in those standings, even if you're not feeling the best about a 7-1 NIP, who I don't know what they have to do to fully start getting some respect, but you saw that head-to-head -head tilt between BLG and JDG, and that's the level other squads are going to need to reach in the LPL if they want to be vying for a title. So squads like Weibo, squads like NIP, everybody going to need to level up to match the Masters of 2023 in the LPL. LPL. But that is it today for League Unlock. Eric and Mark here with you beautiful people. Thanks for watching as always, and we'll catch you on that flippity flip.